Yes. My name is Pastor Jamel. I serve as the impact lead or the impact pastor here at Calvary Wallace. For you guys that don't know me, for you guys that have been here for a little while, you know who I am. This morning, I get the honor and privilege of introducing a gift to this house to you guys. He's going to be delivering the word this morning. The Bible tells us that when he gives us pastors, that he gives us gifts. And Pastors Brad and Pastor Kayla have been some of the best gifts I've ever received in my life. At one point in time, they were top two on my list, and then I got married, so now they're two and three on my list. But they have been some of the best gifts ever. And one of the things about receiving gifts or having gifts is that sometimes they can keep on giving. And it's, I'm thankful that my friends or my gifts decided to share their gifts with me and with you guys. And that's what Pastor Lynn Howes is. He is a gift. He is authentic. He is real. He'll say something to make you laugh, and then he'll say something that'll captivate your mind and say, man, that guy is saying something. He, he's talking about something. So this morning, I want you guys to give a warm Calvary welcome to Dr. Lynn Howes. As he makes his way to the stage, I'm going to give you guys just a little bit of context. There's going to be moments where you're going to write down everything that he's saying. And then there's going to be other moments where you're going to be so intrigued and so caught up in how he's delivering the message of the gra of grace, of the grace of God, that you're going to sit back and just hold on to your seats. So, Dr. Lynn, welcome home. Do with it as you please. Thank you so much. You can be seated and just uh, honored to be here this morning. I hope you helped me preach in the 11 a.m. like they did in the 9 a.m. We had a good time this morning. Hallelujah. So appreciate it. Let me say again, Pastor Kayla, you know, sometimes the women are the unsung heroes. And uh, I don't know if she feels uncomfortable behind the microphone, but she sure didn't act like it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I think sometimes the women seem to be the unsung heroes because they are invisible to some people. My wife is very small, and so it's like people kind of look over her. And, and uh, you know, but I just like, always like to acknowledge the pastor's wife because I, sometimes I think you don't realize what they go through. Of course, Pastor Brad is preaching this morning in Clinton at uh, Russ Emanuel's church. He will be with us tonight, but we hung out last night. We're staying in the same place, so we got to fellowship a little bit last night. But it's an honor to be here, and I want to share some things with you this morning that I, I think will be a blessing to you. And uh, if you help me preach, I'll, I'll, I'll do the best I can. Will you help me respond a little bit? Hallelujah. They did good this morning. Just don't throw stuff at me. Hallelujah. It is good also to have my friends David and Lisa Hughes here this morning, all the way from Benson. They uh, have been a part of our life for a long time and used to pastor there in Benson. And then Cynthia Buck is here this morning as well. Just wave at us, if you would, for a moment, Sister Cindy. Wave your hand. We were just with them Friday night in their home group, and so we had a little gospel circle of our own over there. Hallelujah. And had a good time. Just met them, and, and we're thankful for them. And my young friend that I just met here who had followed from a distance for a long time, and we, I forgot your name, brother, Caleb. Caleb, Brother Caleb, hallelujah. And just, you know, it, it's encouraging to find out when people are listening to you. I, you know, when we, I, I told him back there, I said, you know, the people that hate you have a hair trigger on their writing finger. You know, when they watch, the, you know, the people that don't like your TV program, they'll write you and tell you. But the people who love you are waiting a long time to tell you they're listening. And so sometimes we need that encouragement to find out there's somebody on the other side of this camera, you know. Especially when you do it in a TV studio and there's nobody there but uh, camera crew and stuff, you don't realize. And, of course, our, our TV program has an uh, American reach, a potential reach in the U.S. of 140 million U.S. homes. So we're on almost every uh, outlet there is, DISH, Direct, uh, uh, Comcast, Spectrum. I, I forget all of them. But anyway, we're on on Mondays at 4 o'clock. But when you're behind the camera, you don't see the people that are out there. And then when you get to meet people, that's why I love community. I don't know about you, but whenever we were, uh, you know, kind of away from community, I kind of enjoyed the rest for a little while. But after that, I thought, I, got, I need to be around some people. Because I like people. Hallelujah. I like to be around them. I don't like to be, you know, just hidden or anything. But so I love people. 
If you have your Bible with you this morning, let's open your uh, Bible or your device, whatever the case may be. I'm going to go to Luke, the 10th chapter this morning. And uh, we'll, if you help me, we'll unpack this. So uh, Luke, the 10th chapter, the 25th verse. And I'll read from the King James Version in this uh, particular text. But it says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. But he willing to justify himself said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, let me just stop and unpack this before we get down into the meat of some of this. This is not a lawyer like our secular lawyers. You know, sometimes I think we are so far away from how the audience of that day would have understood some things that we kind of misunderstand a whole lot of stuff that would have been their, their way of thinking. But these are lawyers that are professionals, not just in secular law, but the law of Moses. So they know the legal loopholes and how to, they have become professionals at finding the legal loopholes of the law. You know, I, I didn't tell this in the first service because it was a lot more limited, but you know, we were, my, my, my pastor is my sister. She is the, uh, she's younger than I am, but she's the senior pastor where I attend. I, I, somebody said, you believe in women preachers? I believe in Holy Ghost preachers. I don't care what they look like. Hallelujah. <laughs> My pastor is a woman. I make no mistake about it. She can flat foot preach. She has something to say when she gets up and she blesses me. But she was with me in a conference in Yuma, Arizona. We were flying back and we were sitting on the plane and she had the middle seat and the lady on the end uh, beside of her uh, was, uh, uh, she was the wife of a uh, Jewish lawyer for, I believe it was, I believe it was the Baltimore Orioles. I think it, anyway, it might not have been that team, but anyway, she said to my sister, what were y'all doing in, in, uh, in Arizona? She said, well, we were there for a conference. My brother's a speaker. And so she said, well, what was the subject? And he said, well, she, at that time, I had just written Unforced Rhythms of Grace. She said, well, the subject was grace and new covenant. And the, and the lady said, well, that's interesting because I'm Jewish. I'm fully Jewish. And she said, you know, we started somehow got talking about some of the rules that, that, that they have in, in the Jewish tradition. She said that uh, when the Sabbath hits, we can't. We can't even get up and turn a, a, a light switch off. We have to hire a Gentile to turn it off. So I'm thinking. <laughs> of course, my thought is you could make a fortune just turning the lights off for these people. Yeah. <laughs> she told she said, telling us, we have to pre-tear our toilet paper the night before the Sabbath. And I'm thinking, well, what happens if you get the screaming memes, you know? <laughs> hire a Gentile. Y'all don't want to help me over here. Hallelujah. And she was talking about how they, you know, that they, there were certain ways that they could kind of circumvent these laws. But, I mean, she was going down through all of these laws and stuff. And I'm thinking, man, you know, we preach uh, uh, the parts of the law that fit our culture, and we try to call that the gospel. And we pick and choose what we think the gospel is. And, we, you know, we try to fit that into whatever we, you know, but we never read the whole thing. Amen. You know, in other words, you know, I, I've said this all over the world, but, you know, we used to preach against women don't dress in men's apparel. I can remember them terrorist preachers in rare back and say, women don't dress in men's apparel. <laughs> Some of you women came in here with makeup on your Jezebel face. <laughs> Head levelers on your head and a hell of vision set up in your living room. <laughs> you want God on one hand and the... <laughs> and we terrorize everybody. So I'm thinking to myself as a young man, this God must be real serious about fashion because if he's going to send people to hell for billions of years over their outfit, maybe we ought to get, you know. <laughs> and so I thought, well, you know, I wonder where they found, you know, the text to preach that act because I think these guys, in all respect to them, did the best they could with what they knew. They just didn't know the gospel. They're preaching the wrong covenant. And so, um, hallelujah. I'm chasing too many rabbits here this morning, but... So I went over there to see where they got a text from. And I found the text where they preach women, don't dress in men's apparel, is in the book of Donoronomy. I, I call it Donoronomy because it's more about what you Donoronomy than you Deuteronomy. 
And we would read that one verse and beat the women up and make them look like granny from the Beverly Hillbillies while the preacher looked like he fell off the cover of Fortune 500. I need some help in here. Hallelujah. And I've said it all over the world, but we preach against devil food cake, deviled eggs, deviled ham, have a devil, you, you couldn't eat it. We could eat angel food cake, but we couldn't have devil food cake. It was a sin to drink coffee. The general rule here is if it's a sin, I mean, if it's fun, it's, good. it's a sin probably, and you're probably going to go to hell for it. And I remember even preaching, I've told this here before, but I can remember they preached against Coca-Cola the first time. Even the, even the coffee, the Coca-Cola thing, I was working with this evangelist, and we got 100 miles out of where we were having this tent revival, and we pulled into a truck stop, and this guy orders a cup of coffee, and I'm thinking, you just preached against that. So I'm looking at him real funny, and he's like, well, son, when you get as old and as wise as I am, maybe God will trust you with a cup. So I'm thinking, you know, maturity in Christ means I can drink coffee one day. I've had two cups already this morning, could probably use another one. Hallelujah. So I'm going to bust tail wide open, I guess, anyway. And then I said to him, he'd preach against Coca-Cola. I said, Pastor, what about a Coca-Cola is going to take me to hell? And he couldn't even talk to him in his regular voice. I'd talk in a preacher voice. He said, son, <laughs> you drinking that Coca-Cola from a bottle? <laughs> And it's going to ruin your testimony. Somebody going to think you're drinking something else and you're going to call somebody to go to hell. And I'm thinking, then why don't we preach against root beer? That's in a brown bottle. And so I, I made the mistake of saying that. Why don't we preach against root beer? It's in a brown bottle. He said, son, that Coca-Cola is shaped like a woman and it's liable to make you lust. I'm 16 years old. I said, thanks for that image, you know. <laughs> so I struggled with Coca-Cola till I got in my 40s. And then they came out with three liter bottles and I got over it. Ah, <laughs> right, come on, somebody enjoy yourself this morning. But the very next verse says in that where women don't dress in men's apparel or, or in that very same chapter, it says don't mingle your, gar your thread in a garment with diverse kinds of thread. But I never heard anybody ever preach against a polyester rayon blend. It said you can't put wool and linen together. So if you got on a wool suit and cotton underwear, you go bust tail wide open. <laughs> along with these ladies in slacks this morning. That same chapter, you couldn't eat a catfish, you couldn't eat shrimp, you can't touch a pig skin. That means you can't even play football. Come on, because it's made from a pig skin. And some of you sitting up in here right now with sausage gravy on your breath and bacon on your breath, even though it is $10 a pound right now. But we never preached against that. What I'm saying is we picked and choose the parts of the law that fit our culture. We call that the gospel. And then we become lawyers, legal debaters of how to circumvent the law. And this, this, this lawyer comes to Jesus and he's asking Jesus, what must I do to inherit the kingdom? Or what, not, not, not the kingdom. He said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Hallelujah. Raise your Bible up again, Kayla, if you would. See, Kayla has a copy this morning of my father's last will and testament. My father wrote a will one day and he called it an Old Testament. And then he had a son who was about the father's business and the father, the son was such an incredible businessman that the father got richer. So he said, I think what I'm gonna do since I've enjoyed this son so much is I'm just gonna have a bigger family and bring many sons into glory. And since I got more sons I need to, and I got richer, I need to revise the will and write them in the will. Come on, somebody. Touch your neighbor and tell him somebody died and left you something. Hallelujah. And the reality of it is most of you have never read your copy of the will so you settle out of court. Hallelujah. And the truth of it is, is we never read our copy of the will and we just believe anything anybody tells us. We need to read our copy of the will and find out there's some things we inherit. Now, the first thing I want you to see is you don't do anything to inherit. The lawyer's asking, what must we do to inherit the eternal life? How I many of you don't do anything to inherit if somebody dies and leaves you something? So then the writer of the book of Hebrews gets a hold of that, and he says, without the death of the testator, see, Jesus came and wrapped himself in human flesh and died so you could get what's in the will. That's how much he cares about you getting what's in the will is he came and died so you could get it. 
And then he gets back up from the dead to be the administrator of his own will to make sure you get what he said he could have. Hallelujah. So ain't nobody going to beat you out of your share of the inheritance. But what part of the inheritance is, is you get to inherit eternal life. Now, let me say this to you. Now, there's a lot of things that I'm repeating that I've said in the first service because that's pretty what I need to do because we've got a different, completely different audience. But eternal life is more than just a ticket to heaven when you die. And I say this when, because I want to preface what I want to say by saying this, and I might d- deal with some of this maybe more tonight. I don't know. It just depends on the flow. But say this with me. He believes that eternal life includes going to heaven when you die. Have we got that settled? But it's way, more than, it's way more than when you die. If you're just waiting till you die to get eternal life, you might be in trouble. The word eternal here is the Greek word aeonian. And sometimes, you see, we, we think in terms, see, if I would put you in the mind of a first century Jewish person standing there asking, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's not thinking about heaven. Now, stay with me a minute. Now, I've already told you that includes going to heaven. But in the mind of the first century Jew, he knows that there's an expectancy of a coming age of the kingdom and a coming age where there will be a new covenant because they've read the law and the prophets and they've read Isaiah. So when this guy is asking Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's not just saying, what do I need to do in order to go to heaven? He said, what must I do to inherit the life of the coming age? And the life of the coming age was a life lived in the context of sonship instead of being a slave. Because under the old covenant were servants and slaves, and the new covenant were sons and heirs. It's in your copy of the will. Come on, somebody. And the reality of it is, is that he's talking about the life of the coming age. And uh, I know that since we preached this morning, that one of the things that you taught last week because I helped with the sermon prep on that last week, by the way. I don't know if they leaked that information or not. But uh, I, I, when I teach a lot of stuff about this, I draw, I draw two circles on the board. So if you can picture this in your mind, I'm just building here today to kind of get us where we need to go. If you can picture in your mind this circle, can you see the circle right here? And then I, I usually draw on the board another circle like this, and I think you all had this on the board last week. And right here, two circles converge and they overlap. That overlapping period was from 30 AD to 70 AD, where it was literally a 40 year transition period where most of the New Testament is written as it's lodged between two different ages. And the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 2, or further, I'm, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and he says to that first century church at Corinth, see, we've got to read these letters like they're written to the people they're written to. When you read, if I, if I sent Brad and, and Kayla a letter and, and with some instruction about some stuff going on in this church, I'm not thinking about somebody 2,000 years from now, although there may be some principles relevant to it. The audience I'm talking to is the audience I'm trying to communicate something with. And Paul says to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he says, you are the people upon whom the ends, plural, King James says, of the world have now come. But every other translation translates it correctly using the same word eon. And he says, you are the people upon whom the ends, plural, of the ages, plural, have now come. Well, thank you for that thunder, say amen. Don't want to be too deep on a Sunday morning. You need to come back Sunday night. I'm going to pull the plug out. Hallelujah. But when you think about who the ends of the ages have now come, this gap in between was 40 years. It's actually the same amount of time of the wilderness journey. And Paul is telling the church that the the wilderness journey was an example to them upon whom the ends of the ages had now come. And so what I want you to see is if you could picture this again, it looks like the MasterCard insignia. Can you see it in your mind without a chalkboard? Where, the, where this age here, let's call this the old covenant age, and this one is the new covenant age. 
So where these two ages come together is the ends of the ages. It is the back end of the old covenant age and the front end of the new covenant age, hence the end of the ages. So how many know that what they were looking for was the dawning, and, and, and although the world has got some polluted terminology about new age, how many know they were at the dawning of God giving birth to a brand new world? Hallelujah. And I preached this the other night over at, uh, at uh, the Bucks, uh, but, but the reality of it is, is that when Jesus comes up out of the waters of the Jordan River, he was signifying that a new world was about to be birthed because when Jesus come up out of the waters of baptism, a dove lands on him. The Spirit of God descends on him like a dove. That is significant. You say, why? Because when Noah built an ark and it was a vehicle out of an old world dominated by sin and by the curse, uh, he released two birds out of the window. One was an unclean clean bird it flew all the way through the scripture and landed in the book of revelation where uh, babylon had become the hold of every foul spirit in the cage of every unclean and hateful bird but the dove only flies to the book of matthew chapter 3 where it sees jesus in the river jordan who is the olive branch because the bird was looking come on somebody come on somebody i said he was looking for an olive branch and he was looking for the new world. And when Jesus came up out of the waters of baptism, hallelujah, the Holy Spirit was saying, right here is the beginning of God's brand new creation project that's going to begin with the firstborn among many brethren. And we are an ongoing process or project of God bringing about his new creation project in the earth because every time we get born again, and that's why we have water baptism, is we are signifying, I'm leaving an old world dominated by sin and by the curse behind, and I'm about to enter a new world where the curse has been reversed. I could preach a lot of stuff about the Ark of Noah. I could tell you it, that when the Ark was built, you have to have a tree involved. I could tell you that this Ark was 30 cubits by 50 cubits by 300 cubits. I could tell you that the Bible number 30 means the blood of Christ. The Bible number 50 means Pentecost. And the Bible number 300 means divine completeness, perfection, or maturity. I can tell you this ark had three stories in it. An outer court, a holy place, and a most holy coast. It had a 30-fold, a 60-fold, a 100-fold. I can tell you that this ark represents Christ because he is your vehicle out of an old world. And when you get in this ark, he said, and thou shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And then I would tell you that the Hebrew word for pitch it is the Hebrew word kephar that we translate every place else, atonement. So what makes this boat float called Christ is we've been sealed by the blood of Jesus. It keeps the world out. And we didn't escape the judgment of that world. We were inside of the thing that was judged. So come on, that his death was our death. His punishment was our punishment. His crucif Come on, we were co-crucified, co-buried. Y'all help me preach a little bit. I know you know the gospel here. But when that ark comes to land, it lands on a mountain called Ararat. It's not an accident that it lands in the seventh month, 21st day of the month, which is during the Feast of Tabernacles. A lot of stuff I'm saying here that I'm not going to develop. And he lands on a mountain called Ararat, and the word Ararat means the curse has been reversed. Now, I don't know about you, but the moment I got saved and went down to the waters of baptism and came up, I realized I just entered a brand new world. I don't know how to live in this new world yet. I do know God's never changed his mind about plan A because he says to Noah when he gets out of the boat, which by the way, Noah's name means rest. And he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Hallelujah. Because when you see in his eyes, you don't see judgment, you see grace. Hallelujah. And when he gets off the boat, God said, same plan, different day. Have dominion, subdue. Enjoy the journey. I want to give you life. Not just 70 or 80 years in misery, and then when you die, you get to go to heaven. I want to give you life in that more abundantly because my kingdom is about to come on this planet. And when he's asking Jesus, what must I do to inherit the life of the coming age? He's asking Jesus under an old covenant paradigm because matthew mark luke and john are in the new testament but they are still in the old covenant 
because the covenant had not been yet inaugurated by the blood of Jesus and according to the book of Hebrews even for that 40 year transition that it was fulfilled and everything that was demanded was met in Christ but that covenant was fading away and it was being replaced by a better covenant and they're in this transition for 40 years trying to figure out what goes and what stays y'all follow with me that's why you see them even having these Jerusalem councils should we circumcise these Gentiles or not should we eat meat you know what can we do in other words I'd hate to been the guy that was three days late after that you know that first Jerusalem council do we need to be circumcised he's like I wish y'all had got here three days ago You might ought to get the car ready again here. Hallelujah. That's some rough stuff right there. Hallelujah. So they're, 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 they're figuring it out. I, I think it's tragic, though, that here we are 2,000 and some years later, and I still got to fight with churches as to what covenant they're under. It's like I'm, I'm just, I'm just kind of weary with fighting. I'm just going to tell you the truth. You do with it whatever you want to. I'm, I, I'll turn 65 in October. I ain't got time to mess around anymore. I'm just going to tell you. Hallelujah, if you just think, well, this guy's nuts, well, I'm not out of my mind, I'm just out of yours. You don't like my thoughts, have some of your own, I don't care, hallelujah. But I ain't got time to mess around anymore, so just think the guy's lost his mind. He's been around too long and he's just figured, <laughs> but I just got, I think, some incredibly good news that what Jesus is offering is not just a ticket to heaven somewhere. He's offering the life of the coming age and he's offering it to live it. And Jesus then defines what that is when he says, this is life, Aeonian, or this is the life of the coming age, that you would know God the Father and God the Son. In other words, you would live your life out of the context of a father-son relationship where you would realize that I'm not a servant or a slave I'm an heir of the kingdom and I'm a son and as a son I'm part of the father's business and the part of father's business is bringing about new creation because the, the I think one of the biggest lies the church is told is that the gospel is about getting your ticket out of here rather than being a vehicle to bring what's happening there to operate here. Hallelujah. Because when you see the final chapter of the book of Revelation, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth uh, for the former things that passed away, and I saw the city coming down from God. Come on, it wasn't us going up to it. It was coming down from God like a, uh, come on, a bride adorned for her husband. Come on, the, the city of God. This is too deep for Sunday morning, but I ain't got time to mess around chapter 21 is not about where you go when you die it's not about a place it's a people it's the bride the lamb's wife it's talking about you and it's talking about God's ultimate consummation of bringing together his new creation where heaven and earth remarry again I, I don't have time to develop this his purpose is not to get you out of here it's to get what's happening there to operate here your kingdom come, your will be done. And the reason, somebody said, you know, brother, that, that sounds, sounds awful positive to me. Well, I would think just the possibility that I could be right would be exciting to people, hallelujah, that it doesn't have to fall apart. Maybe it could get better if the church realized its mission and assignment is not to just escape this and leave the rest of it go to hell in a handbasket, but to be the vehicle by which God would heal the sick, raise the dead, and cast out a devil because every time Jesus said, I did that, the kingdom of God has come unto you. So heaven was invading the earth and he says in Deuteronomy 10, I want to give you the days of heaven on earth. And I'm going to make this comment as well. I didn't have time to say this in the first service, but in, uh, in, in Galatians chapter number five, where Paul was talking to the church at Galatia, he first of all says, stand fast in the liberty where Christ has made you free. Don't begin entangled with the yoke of slavery. And I always heard that preach growing up. Well, that's, you're going back to your sin when you do that. that that's not the context. Right, on, a text out of context is just a con. Come on, come on. And then he starts warning them about going back under the law and going back up under circumcision. And he said, if you have gone back up under the law, you've fallen from grace. Yeah. Falling from grace doesn't mean you sinned last night. Falling from grace means you went back under the wrong covenant. And he warns them. He said, you know, you started out in the spirit. Do you think you're going to be made perfect in the flesh? Everybody say flesh. Paul says in Romans 5 or 6, he said, when we were in under the law, we were in the flesh. Everybody say flesh. So Paul is calling being in the flesh, not I had had a bad thought. Now that might be part of it, but hear what I'm coming from. He's telling them, if you think you can do this through human effort and sweat and labor, and you think your flesh can produce this. 
context, he starts in by saying this. Don't go back under the law. Those Judaizers that are trying to bring you back under circumcision, he says, I would that they were cut off. That's King James' nice word for saying, I hope the knife slips. That's exactly what he's saying. Read it in other translations. He calls them the mutilators. Come on, somebody. Because it's all about flesh. And then in that chapter, he says, for the works of the flesh are made manifest, which are these. Hatred, malice, envy, strife, divisions, emulations, drunkenness. He starts listing all this stuff. Now watch this. Stuff you see in every church. Now we want to preach the big three. Or the sins that we think are the biggies and say they that do such things are not going to inherit the kingdom. Now watch, stay with me just a moment because I want, to, I, want to, I want you to see how this is really, what he's really saying here. He's saying to them that if you're up under law, Here's what it's going to produce. Hatred, malice, envy, strife, division. That's why we got problems in churches because Paul says in another place that when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Boy, it's getting quiet now. He said, but sin will not have dominion over you because you're not under law but under grace. Turn that around. Sin will have dominion over you if you're under law and not under grace. I'm, I'm teaching a little bit here this morning. So what he's trying to show them is that what's causing this hatred and malice and envy and strife and division that you see especially manifest in Pharisees. See, you're looking at a recovering Pharisee this morning. I'm in rehab. That's why I came to Calvary Church. Hallelujah. Is to get a pharisectomy. <laughs> Woo! That's a nice word and hallelujah. But what Paul is saying, <laughs> there you go, hallelujah. Keep throwing the money. I'm just getting. <laughs> But the reality of it is, is what Paul is saying is if you're under law and you're trying to do this by human sweat, labor, and flesh, it's producing hatred, malice, envy, strife, and division. And he says this, I'm, I've told you before and I'm going to tell you again. They which do such things will not inherit the kingdom. Now let me say, say this. He did not say they that do such things will not go to heaven. Because we're not talking about earning again. He said, they which do such things will not inherit. Because they're under a covenant that won't let you inherit. It wants to earn. It's got lawyers. Except you never meet the criteria. You never get good enough. It's always a carrot in front of you. Like if you just keep preaching, you're need-based, man-centered. And we stand around altars begging God for stuff we already have. Because nobody ever told us what's ours and what we have and what we have is a right. But he goes on to say, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering. In other words, once you get in the Spirit, you're going to see changes in your life. And these sins are going to fall away. But you, what, you know what I found as, my, as, I, as literally as I came into an understanding of finished work and grace is I found myself, Pastor David, loving people. Not because it was fake or because the Bible said I had to. But because I don't see them through the eyes of judgment any longer. But through the lens of an old covenant paradigm that says, I thank God I'm not like that sinner. I see by them through the same lens as I see myself as somebody desperately in need, come on, of a Savior. Because the whole point of the law was to, in Romans 1, 2, and 3, is that he, the whole point of the law is to conclude all under sin so he can have mercy on all. And the Message Bible says it like this, we're all in the same sinking boat, insider, outsider. Come on, Pharisee, Jew, Gentile, we're all in the same sinking boat. There's none righteous, no, not even one. At the end of the law is you need a Savior. And somebody said, well, you guys are just preaching grace because there's sin in your life. I said, you better believe it. <laughs> Is that too authentic for you from this pulpit to the door? If it ain't grace, ain't none of us going to make it. 
You know, as we want to pick and choose the big sins, we can see in Galatians 3, said that if you do that, you ain't going to go to heaven. But I got to tell you something, man. If you don't find yourself somewhere in that list, you, you know, come on, it ain't just one or two of them. You, come on, help me, help, help me now. In other words, it's not based on, I, I'd ask people all the time, how many good works does it take for you to be saved? How many? Does, you know, 100, 200, 300, 500? How many know you can't do enough good works to get saved? Let me turn the coin over. How many bad works does it take to be unsaved? Now, I'm not suggesting you do bad things. What I'm trying to do is lead you into what it is that produces the good things. And that is to bring you into your unity with Christ in this new creation and into the realm of spirit where the spirit does in you what you could not do for yourself. Because the old covenant was full of demand and the new covenant is full of supply. The old covenant is a law you have to keep and the new covenant is a life uh, that'll keep you. The old covenant, you live by a bunch of rules. In the new covenant, you live out of a relationship. And what Jesus is offering is he came to show us the Father. And we don't realize the impact of how big that was when he said what, John said, behold, what an incredible quality of love the Father's bestowed on us that we might even be called the sons of God. In other words, we move from this austere uh, judge to he's Abba. And he's a daddy God. And yes, he corrects me, but he doesn't do it to be vindictive or punitive he does it because he wants to give me the best life on the planet yet sin matters in the new covenant not because of what it does to God but because of what it does to you and it's because what it what it does to this new world God is trying to create so if you want to know how this new world comes about God's whole expression in the beginning was through love. So when you see Jesus reach down to somebody who everybody else rejected, come on, hallelujah, and picks him up out of the, come on, hallelujah, says, neither do I condemn you. What you're seeing is God's new world invading somebody's world. You know what's really cool? We're carriers. We're seeds in the new garden God is planting. Man, I'm a mess. Hallelujah. We carry something, man. The potential of the seed of God in us has the potential to change my personal world. But it has the power to change an entire globe. And as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Because here's what our assignment is, is to behold him and then reflect his image to the planet. That's what is the glory that we've come short of. Are you, are you tracking with me? Now, I'm not getting far here, but this lawyer comes to Jesus. So what must I do to inherit? Jesus then, because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are under the law, and he's asking under the law, what do I need to do? Jesus gives him the law. He only deals with two of them. And one of the things I want to say about that is that even in this context, he ups the ante of what we think worship is and loving God. To the, he ups the ante of how we treat our neighbor to the same level as he does of how we worship God. And he says that in another place, if you bring your gift to the altar and there you remember that your brother has ought against you, leave your gift at the altar and then come and, 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 you know, in other words, go be reconciled to your brother and then bring your gift back to the altar. In other words, he's elevating worship, not to just an event we do on Sunday morning where we sing songs. It's not just vertical, but it's horizontal. That worship is actually how I express myself and how I treat other people. Because if you've done it to the least of these, you've done it. Come on, somebody. Because when you reach down and you help the homeless, come on, you touch the patient that's sick. You, are you hearing what, what's happening is God's new world just came on the scene. A kingdom ambassador just walked in the room. Think about the power of that. A kingdom ambassador just walked in the room as a representative of the kingdom that we represent. And what we carry with us is love, joy, peace. Revelation 21 said the trees of this, the leaves of this tree will heal the nations. It'll heal your marriage. It'll heal your family. I'm getting too deep on Sunday morning here. Hallelujah. He said, but so Jesus gives him the law and, and, and the, the Bible goes on to say, that uh, he said, thou hast answered, I do this and thou shalt live. And he, but he willingly, watch this, because what happens under the law, when you start to preach the law, but he willing to justify himself. Yep. Yes. Yes. Said, 
Well, who is my neighbor? In other words, we need some legal loopholes. We need some Gentiles to turn the light switches off. In other words, you know, I, I was terrible with them last night. We were just sitting around talking last night uh, at where we're staying. That I've been, I've been going to these Amish people, preaching for these Amish people. Craziest thing I've ever seen. Amish. I'm talking about straight up horse and buggy Amish people. They called me and said, will you come preach for us? I said, I don't know if I'm your cup of tea, man. And they're like, yeah, we've been watching you on YouTube in our barns. We can't have electric in the house, but we got it in the barn. Hallelujah. <laughs> We could plug our phone in on the outside of the barn, you know, and we could, they can buy me an $80,000 tractor and then borrow it anytime they want to, you know, and so they find the legal loopholes. I'm literally preaching for these guys and, and they're getting set free from all this incredible bondage. And I'm sitting on the porch a few years ago with the ladies on Mother's Day and the men are inside cooking for them, which is totally unheard of in this culture. And I'm sitting on the porch with the ladies and they're like, we could build a statue to you. It is all we can do to keep from worshiping you, Brother House. Thank you. They're driving Lincoln Navigators. Now, one of them bought himself a jet. I said, are you free to travel? So we went from, for, we went from horse and buggy to being set free, dressing nicer, looking better, different. The world has changed. Give them, the real gospel will give you back your life. And, and just last year, I went to Lancaster to a group not far, quite as far along, but they were so on the edge of their seat, I literally had to tear myself away from them because they want to get set free so bad from all of this performance bondage. They're trying, to, they're trying to earn God's approval, and they just need to know He already loves them, He already approves of them, that it's not what they did that brought them in, it's what He did. God accepted you long before you ever accepted Him. Come on, He was reconciled to you long before you were ever reconciled to Him, and there's two sides to that coin. Come on, but when you realize God is not mad at you, but he's mad about you, and that if you just let him do the work, he will be the one that becomes the source of life that changes you from the inside out and gives you this incredible life in the kingdom right now because Galatians 5 is not about after a while. It's about what brings God's new world into your environment. And you, you know, even if we would just bring our brain... And come to church, we would figure out when Jesus was teaching the kingdom, and he would say the kingdom of God is like, or the kingdom of heaven is like, he was not talking about other world stuff. He was talking about this world stuff. Stewardships and how we treat other, sowing and reaping. You're tracking with me? And that was the message he preached. In other words, he was talking about what they were expecting to come was the coming king that would be like the royal seed of David, except their whole mindset about how this is going to happen is they're thinking in terms of somebody like David who will come and lead an insurrection, overthrow the government of the Romans, and set up a natural kingdom. I think we got a lot of people still think like that. Now, I believe politics are important in their place, but the kingdom's not coming from the White House. It's coming from your house. God's new world's not coming through legislative power because if it could have, Moses had the best laws on the planet. Somebody said, well, here's how we're going to do it. We're going to, yeah. we're going to vote the right guy in and we're going to pass the laws we want and we're going to take over. Now, I do believe that it's important who is in power. I do believe it's important to vote. I encourage you to do it. I think it's important to be involved in that kind of stuff. And God always has people that I believe are even called for that. And I think we should have been raising some people to that end rather than raising them to evacuate somewhere we might not be in the mess we're in but what i'm after is even if we passed you say well what we're going to do is sin i used to think like this even concerning the kingdom well let's just pass the laws we want and then let the church run the government and then i started studying history and realized wait a minute this ain't the first time that ever happened the church has been the head the the, the king was the head of the church that's why the pilgrims came here. Yeah. Was to get out from underneath the pressure and tyranny of legalism. Yeah. Yeah. So if you could pass laws to produce the kingdom, then Moses had the best ones on the planet. But guess what? It didn't produce the kingdom. Yeah. Right. Oh, y'all quiet on me now. On. Because you can't legislate righteousness. I'm, I'm after a point here. So let's say, okay, let's say, we, uh, Lynn, you're wrong. We're going to do that. We're going to take over, and we're going to pass the laws we want. Now, I do believe that there are laws that we need to have to govern the ungodly. Don't misunderstand where I'm coming from. 
for the sin of the ungodly. But, the, but, but I'm after something here this morning is that if you could, if you could pass, if we could, if we could run the government, let me ask you this. Which church do you want to run it? You want the Catholic church to run it? What about the Pentecostal holiness church we came from? Been there, done that, got the t-shirt and the wounds to prove it. I'm a, come on, I'm a recovering Pharisee. Hallelujah. What are you saying? They asked Jesus, this, he was demanded of the Pharisees because they thought the kingdom of God would immediately appear because the king's on the scene. And it was appearing. But watch this. They asked Jesus, when will the kingdom come? Now watch this. The question was, it, Lord, when are we going to the kingdom? That's the wrong answer. I mean, that's the wrong question. So he said, when will the kingdom come? And he leans back and says to them, the kingdom does not come with your careful observances. Neither will they say, lo here or lo there, for the kingdom of God is within you. And so as I, as I looked at that word observation, and I saw it in other translations, it said it doesn't come by your careful observances. What he's saying to a bunch of legalistic Pharisees is, and all of a sudden, Galatians popped into my mind where Paul said, I am afraid of you, Galatians. Oh, foolish Galatians, who bewitched you? You started out in the spirit. You think you'll be made perfect in the flesh. And he talks about them going back up under the law. And he said, I'm afraid of you because you observe laws and feasts and months. And all of a sudden, I realized, wait a minute. The kingdom doesn't come through observation, and he's rebuking them for observing. What he's saying is the kingdom is not coming through the observance of, of old covenant rituals. That if the kingdom is not kingdom inside of you, that in this kingdom, the king himself, I feel the Holy Ghost, moves out of a natural building and into a spiritual house. Where the government of heaven starts to set itself up inside of you and the kingdom of God is within you and you become a dispenser of the kingdom so that wherever you go, come on, you are dispensing righteousness, peace, and joy because that's what the kingdom is. is come on, righteousness, peace, and joy is located in the Holy Ghost and we become the spout where the glory comes out. We become vehicles that God is using to release in the earth His glory. Hallelujah. Now, does that change uh, politics? Absolutely. Because then we become the salt and the light that starts to influence some stuff that begins to change. Because if you don't change the hearts of men, you can get them to act a certain way. But if their heart hadn't been changed, you might get to see law can change your behavior, but only grace can change your heart. That's why we need to not back down and unapologetically preach the grace of God and the new covenant and the kingdom of God right now, because that's the answer our problem is we are torn apart with every concept and division pitted against each other there's always an us and a them but what breaks that is when you break out of that cycle and when you can love your enemy when you can do good to them that despitefully use you it brings God's new world into that hate and it starts to dis come on somebody it starts to dissipate it now I don't want to chase all that rabbit but this guy was willing to justify himself. But Jesus goes on to say, and Jesus answered, he said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest. Everybody say priest. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. See, because religion can point out your problem, but it don't have no remedy for it. So it just avoids you when you're in one. It can tell you how bad you are, but it don't know nothing to do for you. It passes by on the other side. And likewise, on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him and bound him up his wounds. Pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to Calvary Church in Wallace, North Carolina and took care of him. Yes, sir. 
Hallelujah. And on the morrow, when he departed, took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more when I come, I will repay thee. In other words, whatever cost to make you better, I've either paid the price or I'll pay the price for it. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Now let me just t take this uh, up and break it down a little bit further. He found him wounded. At where thieves had found him and stripped him and left him wounded. And the Levite comes by and looks at him. Now let me, let me get this. John 10, if you could bring, you have that up. Can you bring that up for me? John chapter 10, St. John chapter 10, verse number 1. I'll, I'll quote it while, if, if they bring it up, all right. If not, no, not a problem. But John 10, John, St. John 10, verse 1 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up, say this with me, some other way the same is a thief and a robber are we good do we have that and it goes on to talk about but i am the door and by me if any man enter in he will find pasture because i'm the good shepherd i'm the door of the sheep and, and my sheep hear my voice and another they will not follow and then he gets down into saint john chapter 10 verse number 10 and he says this for the thief cometh not for to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But I am come that you might have life and that more abundantly. Not just a ticket to heaven. That's included in the package. See, if heaven is like where you go to church at, do you really want to go there? Just a thought again. If you don't like my thought, have some of your own. Hallelujah. Yeah, Brother Hosko, we're going to sing and shout throughout eternity. I'm like, we can't get 20 minutes out of you now. <laughs> See, I found out heaven is not just a location. It's a relationship. And I already got it here. And when this flesh gets wore out and I go there, it's not going to be foreign to me. I'm a citizen right now. Come on. It's because the scripture don't teach we go to heaven by death. We go to heaven by birth. When we're born again, we see the kingdom of God. We got translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Come on. Hallelujah. We're citizens right now. Got dual citizenship. Got a right. Come on. to every, all, I got a right to all the heavenly government programs. And they don't have a department of health. They have a ministry of health and healing. Come on, they don't have a military, they have a ministry of defense. I, hallelujah. You got to think like a kingdom person here. So the, what, what I want you to see is that this, the, the, this guy is found bleeding and dying then a guy beside this road, and he's been wounded by a sister. But John 10.10 10 says that the thief cometh not but for to kill, steal, and destroy. Now let me just say this. The thief of John 10 is not the devil. I know we've said it so many times. The devil comes, kills, still not in the text. The devil's never mentioned in John 10. Go home and read it. Now, I'm not saying the devil couldn't be involved somehow and try to twist some things. But the thief of John 10 is very clear. Matter of fact, there's a whole chapter back there on my latest book, The Great I Am. But the thief of John 10 is, say this with me, some other way. The same is a thief and a robber. Some other way. Jesus says that same chapter, all that ever came before me are thieves. Now what came before him? You thought the way into the sheepfold was through the performance of the old covenant. Here's a scripture that took new light for me. People come to me a lot and they'll say, Dr. House, when I get my act together, I'm going to come to your church. And I'm like, when you get your act together, it's just an act. And some of you could win an Oscar. I, I said, I've sat in green rooms a lot of times. Like, pull the mask off, man. I, it, it, religion just frustrates me. It's kind of like I can't really take it anymore. It's just like. Yeah. <laughs> Let me go sit around a campfire with my boys or something. I don't know. I just, you know, the pretense is just too much. We put on our precious Jesus face and walk in it. God wonderful, you know. We just, you know, hallelujah. We pretend like everything's okay. 
God's not looking for actors. He's looking for people who are authentic, just come like you are, and that's and he does the changing. But here's the thing. I, he says, and then I say, well, bro, brother, brother Hiles, I just, well, I know I fell, and I've been, I've been a rascal, and I just need to get back on the straight and narrow. And to them, they think the straight and narrow is performance Christianity. Here's what the scripture says, really in a chapter, I believe it's prior to the one I just read, where he says, strive to enter in at the straight gate. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life, not heaven. And once again, we're reading into the context. It leads to life and few there be that find it. Broad is the way, wide is the gate that leads to destruction. And many there be that go in thereat. Listen, the straight gate that he's talking about there was not performance Christianity. It was the real door and gate and way that was Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That the way that they were not finding was him. They thinking that the way was through the broad way of, come on, that really ended in destruction was the law and the prophets and trying to do, come on, their long prayers for pretense and all the stuff. He said, you search the scripture for in them you think you have eternal life. You think you have the life of the coming age, but that's not the life. They testify about me because I am the true vine. I am the door. I am the way. Hey, hallelujah. I am the light of the world. I, I am the true bread that came down for you. Thought that was, but that's not it. In the book back there called The Great I Am, I talk about the seven times in the Gospel of John that Jesus says, I am. And every time he says, I am, it's always in contrast to something from the old covenant. You thought that was the way. That's not the way. I'm the way. You thought that was the truth. That's not the truth. I'm the truth. You thought Moses was the light. That's not the light. I'm the light. Hallelujah. In other words, he begins to show them that the only way in is through him. See, that's the shift. It's tragic that I've got to stand up here this morning, 2,000 years past the, the dawning of a new covenant and try to convince people in the church what covenant they're under. It's like we've never learned how to rightly divide the word of truth. And rightly dividing the word of truth does not mean we know Greek and Hebrew. It means we know which covenant we're in. And so, listen, this guy that was bleeding and dying because of thieves, I submit to you that the guy that's bleeding and dying here on the Jericho Road because of thieves was a man who had been robbed and stolen from, from a religious system that left him with the life running out of him rather than life coming into him. Because Jesus didn't came to say, I didn't came to give you more laws. I came to give you a life. Not a law you have to keep. I came to give you life. And then, you know, I shared this story this morning. You know, my mama, I probably shared it all over the country, but my mama, you know, I can remember her coming in. We grew up around a lot of classical Pentecost. And I, I, let me just say in respect that I believe that those people did the best they could with what they knew. They are well-meaning. But my mom would come and she'd, she'd give a testimony. And at that time, you know, she had real Pentecostal and, and she'd say, I saw a saint of God. God, did she get that jerk on her? Mm. Sunday, you know, she's going to speak. Ooh, hallelujah. Now, I'm not making fun of it because I get a jerk on me every now and then still. Hallelujah. Somebody said, I'll never do that. God just took that as a personal challenge. Hallelujah. And my mama said, I knew she was a saint. Mm, hallelujah. Because I knew, ooh, I knew she was a saint of God because of the glow on her face. Mm, hallelujah. And I'm a little kid. I'm about nine years old. And I'm thinking to myself, Mom, that is not a glow. That's a shine from no makeup. <laughs> if you put a little powder on that, it'll go right away. <laughs> and I'm thinking, Mom, you knew her because she looked like you. She had a top knot or a beehive. No makeup on, no jewelry on, a dress down about halfway between her knees and ankles, pantyhose on with black hair shining through because it was a sin to shave your legs back then. I don't know where we got that scripture at, but oh, that's too much information right there. Thank you, Jesus, for freedom. <laughs> oh, help me, Holy Ghost. And so this woman looked like she came off the... Granny from the Beverly Hillbillies. And my mama said, what a testimony this woman's life was to the people in that grocery, mm, grocery store. And I'm thinking to myself, Mom, the people in the grocery store are not thinking this is a real light to us. 
They're thinking, you mean your God makes you look like this? You mean your God will steal your self-esteem and the value of your beauty? That your God will steal your romantic, come on, notions between you and your husband? I, I wish I could get some help up in here about right now. And we've stolen their looks and their dignity. And I mean, the gossip, I almost feel like when I get up, I'll apologize to women because we, they took the brunt of a whole lot of this legalism. Hallelujah. And I'm thankful for what God is doing among women. Hallelujah. But the reality of it is, is that was not a light that was almost repulsive to the world because then the world thinks, you know what? What I want to do is I want to live my life. And maybe when I'm 85 and got two more breaths left, I'm going to ask Jesus into my heart and make it in by the skin of my teeth. Because if I can do that, at least I enjoyed the journey. I got some good news for you, man. I'm having fun, fun, fun till daddy takes the T-bird away. Hallelujah. I'm enjoying my journey because the gospel is not a about a life after a while it's about the life becomes the light and what God wants to do is so work in us that we've got the best marriages the happiest people on the planet and people say I want a life like that one I want to hang out with those folks I want to be with them come on somebody that's the life that the straight and narrow leads to but the straight and narrow is him he's the highway he's the run come on uh, by whom all of this is attained am I making sense to you all so when this guy who is bleeding and dying, he's dying because religion has robbed him and the Levites and the priests are walking to the other side because this guy has left stripped naked and dying. I was that man. Wounded by not so much the world. The world accepted me. I was wounded by a religious system that meant well. It thought it was about enforcing the rules. And by golly, if you break them, we love the rules more than we love people. I'm not getting far here this morning. But Jesus pours in oil and wine. I need to to quit chasing rabbits here. Oil and wine are stuff that's in Zion. Now that's important because Hebrews, the 12th chapter says, for you did not come to blackness and darkness. You didn't come to fear and trembling. You didn't come to a God who says stay away. You have not come to the mount that says if you touch the edge of the mountain, you will be thrust through with the dart. So terrible was the sight that even Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. He said, you did not come to that mountain. That was Mount Sinai where the law was given. But that's the mountain we bring people to every Sunday morning. And they walk away afraid, just like the children of Israel. We're afraid of him. You go talk to him, and whatever he says to you, we will do it. And they forfeit a personal relationship with God for a mediator system. Somebody else, a Levite or a priest. Are you, are you tracking with me? But you have come to Mount Zion. You're not marching there. You're not on your way. Not some glad morning. You are come to Mount Zion. And you've already come to the city of the living God. And you've come to an innumerable company of angels. And you've already come to the spirits of just men made perfect. You've come to Jesus, the mediator of a better covenant. And the blood of sprinkling, this speaks better things than the blood of Abel. So when you pour that in to people who are bleeding and dying, they start to get healed. Come on, I see people all over this room in the spirit right now getting healed of some stuff. You've been healed of a lot of wounds. And you said in church, I said, even between services, talking to some people, saying, man, some of the wounds that I had, I'm still recovering from. Because I used to think when I'd sat there, listen, as a young man, I'd sit under some of that stuff and think, this ain't right. I don't know what is, but this ain't it. Something in my spirit was telling me. And I thought, man, that's the devil talking to me. It was God talking to you. It was God saying, get up out of that, man, because it's going to kill you if you stay in there. Most people can only survive it for a little while because there's a lot of abuse in that. And people are dealing with a lot of psychological problems today because of stuff that happened in religion by well-meaning people. Don't have time for that this morning. But the bottom line is Jesus begins to pour in some oil and wine, and he starts to heal some stuff. And all of a sudden, you start to get healed inside. And you start to think, I think I can help some other people get healed. I think I can find some folk that I know in my family that have been wounded and and the gospel is not what you think it used to be. It's not your father's Oldsmobile. We're finding out the real gospel is being preached. And when it does, it makes men free. It gives them full of joy and peace and righteousness. He pours in the oil and the wine. And when you get enough Holy Ghost wine, come on, you dance, shout, and you will celebrate. Because the kingdom of God is a party. Hallelujah. Now let me show you this. So he's... He tells him, whatever it takes 
to make you better, I'm going, I'm, I'm going to pay the price. Now, go with me if you would. Uh, let me just get this in, and I'm going to try to get out your way. It means absolutely nothing. <laughs> Luke 21. I'm not Luke. Le, I'm sorry. Leviticus 21. Go with me here to Leviticus Leviticus 21, verse 17. I pray that the eyes of our understanding will be flooded with light this morning. Now, you're going to think I'm preaching the law here for a moment, but stay with me. I promise you I'm not. Verse 17. Speak unto Aaron, saying, Whoever he be of thy seed in their generations... That has any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. For whatsoever man he be that has a blemish, he shall not approach. A blind man or a lame man, or he that has a flat nose. Lost my place there. Hallelujah. He that has a flat nose or anything superfluous, which is like a running sore. Or a man that's broken footed or broken handed. Or a crookback, or a dwarf, or that has a blemish in his eye, or be scurvy, or scabbed, or hath his stones broken. Ouch. It's in your Bible. No man that has a blemish of the seed of the seed of Aaron, the priest shall come nigh to offer the offering of the Lord made by fire. He has a blemish, he shall not come nigh to offer the bread of his God. Now I want to stop here for a moment. Because I used to preach this when I was a legalist. Somebody told me one time, you know, when I imitate how the legalist preachers used to do, say, you do that really good. I said, such were some of us. Yeah. <laughs> but like Paul, come on, my conversion was on a road, hallelujah, when I realized I needed some grace myself. Yeah. Interestingly enough, Ananias opens the eyes of the apostle Paul, and Ananias' name means grace. Yeah. So it's only grace that can open the eyes. Come on, hallelujah. Yeah. Of a legalist. But what happened is, is that when I would preach this, I would say, if you got a club foot, it's because you ain't walking in holiness and you ain't walking on the straight and narrow and you crippled in your walk with God and you disqualified from eating the bread of your God. You can't serve the bread of your God and you ain't welcome at the table because you need to get your walk straight before you get. If you got a withered hand, it's because you ain't doing what you're supposed to do with the kingdom of God and your hand is withered and you ain't, you're powerless and you don't have what it takes to walk. And I, man, I'd preach that. If you got a hunch back, it's because you bow to the earth uh, and all you ever see is a realm of dust in the realm of Satan and all that's going on in the earth. Uh, if you got a flat nose, uh, it's because you got your nose in everybody else's business. Hallelujah. It's because you ain't got no discernment up in your life. Uh, see, I'm getting it on me now. Hallelujah. If I had a ham but B3 organ, we'd drag that. <laughs> Uh, hallelujah. If you got a flat nose, it's because you ain't got no discernment. If you got a running sore, it's because you got a grudge against your neighbor and God ain't going to forgive you because you ain't got no forgiveness in your life. Uh, if you a dwarf, it's because you never growed up in the things of God uh, and you sat in church your whole life and all you ever did was wear diapers uh, and God uh, ain't going to invite you to the table uh, and you can't eat the bread of your God and you can't even serve the bread of your God. And the whole time I'm preaching that, if you got crushed stones, it's because you're a eunuch. Not unique, eunuch. <laughs> Help me, Holy Ghost. Somebody's circumcision knife missed, and you were cut off, as the Apostle Paul would say. That's probably what happened to the guy. Because that's what religion does to you, it'll stop you from being productive. And when I read all of that and preached like that, I'm thinking to myself, everything I just preached, half of it hit me. And I'm thinking, well, I'm going to preach it anyway because maybe somebody will live it. Hallelujah. Their blood's on my hands if I don't tell them. You know, it's a fear stuff. We're trying to scare people everywhere. And man, I started to realize that they, you couldn't eat the bread of God. You couldn't come to the table if you were had any of these any of these. And then this guy left bleeding. Dad's got a whole lot of these symptoms. 
And then it began to dawn on me. And I've got another book back there called Unforced Rhythms of Grace that have every one of these miracles in it. But then I started seeing that every one of these uh, uh, things that were disqualified in the book of Leviticus, Jesus handpicks it to heal it in the New Testament. He finds a woman bowed to the earth. She's a hunchback. And she's disqualified from serving the bread of God or eating the bread of God. And, and the true bread from heaven just walked up to her on the Sabbath day. I need some help in here for about 10 more minutes. Hallelujah. And the bread of God walks up to this woman who is bowed to the earth and could in no wise lift up herself. And interestingly enough, this woman has been bowed to the earth for 18 years. I shared this a little bit in the first service. I might develop it a little bit more here. If you count, 18 is the number of bondage, but it's also six plus six plus six. Somebody talked about the 666 earlier. I wrote a book in 1993 I called Beauty and the Beast. And in this book that's almost out of print, I talk about how the number of the beast in Revelation was not written with Greek numbers, but with Greek letters that had a numerical value of 666. It is amazing to me the incredible mathematician that God is because every word in the New Testament has a numerical value. And the very first word I found out in the New Testament, there are only five of them. I'm not going to go into all of them. But the very first one that has a numerical value of 666 is the word tradition. And it's where Jesus said, you have by your tradition made the word of God ineffective. And while we're waiting on the man of sin to come to Washington, D.C., it might be in the church because it looks like a lamb but talks like a dragon. Revelation 13. Somebody help me a little bit. Yeah. Hallelujah. And I might just drop this. I know there's a lot of historic fulfillment to some of this, but I think it's probably in some of the sermon prep that's, gonna, that's preached in some because I've been consulting again. Hallelujah. Yeah. But the man of sin, from its idealistic or spiritual view, the man of sin that sits in the temple of God is not somewhere in the Middle East. See, let me just tell you something. Is, am I too deep for this? Is, can I say some things here or something? <laughs> If you don't you eat the grapes, spit out the seeds. Even if you believe eschatology different than I do, the fact that there's no temple in the Middle East tells me we are no closer, we are not on the verge of the end. There's no temple for the man of sin to set in. Paul was writing to a first century church and he's saying to them, don't be warned as a letter if it were from us. But see, let me tell you from a spiritual viewpoint, the man of sin that sits in the temple of God is when you think there's, come, raise your hand at me, wave at me a minute. I mean, you're the temple of God. So the only, from God's viewpoint, there's only ever been two men of the earth. The first man was of the earth. He was earthly. The second man was the Lord from heaven. Adam was perfect, but he fell from a 777 to a 666. He became a, come on, he fell in his spirit, his soul, and his body. Are you tracking with me? That's the lowest common denominator I know how to deal with here. And what happened is what we do is because we don't know the gospel, we allow a man of sin to sit in the temple of God, showing them himself that he is God. But can I tell you that the Lord destroys him with the brightness of his coming. When Jesus comes in, the man of sin leaves your temple. Come on, because in that night, I'm preaching too much here this morning. I'm leaking too much information. But Matthew 24 says, in that night, touch your neighbor, say in the night season. When you don't have no revelation, there are two men in the bed. Not a man and his wife, two men. Adam and Christ. One of them's got to go. Come on, somebody. One's got to be taken and the other's going to be left behind. Let me tell you, the one that was taken was the wicked in Noah's day because he compares it with a, come on, because what happened again is Noah's day was a picture of an old world being removed and a new world coming on the scene. God's new world came. And what happens is there's not two men in my bed. There's no duality inside of me. I don't have two men living in me. When Jesus comes in, come on, hallelujah, he reveals that by the spirit of his mouth and destroys it. When he comes in, it goes out. Now, I know there's a lot of other prophetic implications that I can make. Let me just say this i am way over here more than i wanted to on a sunday morning revelation 15 verse 1 and 2 says and i saw it were, as it were a sea of glass and them that got the victory over the beast over his image and over the number of his name and they stood on top of the sea of glass having the harps of god and they sang the song of moses 
That analogy is drawn from an imagery of the tabernacle of Moses where the sea of glass was not a great big ocean. It was the brazen laver. Solomon called it the brazen sea or the sea of glass. And the reason it's called the sea of glass was because this piece of furniture in the tabernacle was right after the altar of incense or after the blood sacrifice, after the, altar, the, the sin offering, the brazen altar. And then the next step would be a big basin made from the looking glasses of the women that stood at the door of the tabernacle. They took their compacts, if you will, their mirrors, and they beat them into a mirror. They filled that mirror, that basin, with water from the smitten rock. Now, I mean, how many of we know the rock is Christ? And then they would walk up after they had sacrificed the animals, and they would wash the inner sacrifices of the, of the, of the animals in this brazen labor in that water so that it put blood in the water. So if you're going to walk up here to the sea of glass, once you've been blood bought and you look into the water, you're going to see yourself through the blood. And when you see yourself through the blood, you're not going to see yourself in Adam. The image of the beast, come on somebody, and the man of sin is going to be removed and you're going to stand on top of it. And you're going to sing the song of Moses. The song of Moses was sung when they crossed the Red Sea and the persons above that said, I saw look what looked like blood to a horse's bridle. It is drawing from the imagery of the Exodus out of Egypt when they came to the waters of the Red Sea which speak of baptism because it looked like blood to a horse's bridle. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. And what he's saying is you are leaving the old world behind and you are leaving your old man behind and you are leaving the one who dominated that and your sin nature behind. Hallelujah. Because something happened inside of you that has left you come on hallelujah that full of the holy ghost now you're the temple of god without two men living inside of you well that was extra they didn't get that in the 9 a.m and i know i probably just opened a big can of worms there hallelujah but i want to first i want to i need to bring this to a close so this woman who's bowed to the earth because of tradition because of an uh, it's pro god see the reason see religion is pro god but antichrist it substitutes the work of men's hands which is idolatry if you get enough information about good and evil you can make yourself like god adam that substitutes your human effort for the power of the holy ghost and your utter dependence on him who is the life that we have to draw from am i losing you or are we all right Hallelujah. Now, let me, let me say this. When this woman is bowed to the earth, Jesus walks up to her on the Sabbath, and he says he defaults to a covenant that preceded Moses' covenant. He said, ought not this woman, who is a daughter of Abraham, do you know who you are this morning? You're Abraham's seed. Ought not this woman, who's the daughter of Abraham, be loose from this infirmity? And he says to her on the Sabbath, stand upright and be loose. And all of a sudden, Man, he heals her on the Sabbath and the carnal mind of these Pharisees go out of the safety zone and they're like, who does this man think he is that he heals on the Sabbath? And I think you, I, we would think if you saw a miracle like this, I don't know about you, I don't care if it was Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday night, I don't care if it's two o'clock in the morning. I'm like, man, that was awesome. Hallelujah. But they're like, you broke the rules. You broke the rules. You healed the woman on the Sabbath. I'm like, hey, then you just see what happened. And Jesus turns around and says, listen, you would loose your ox or your ass on the Sabbath and lead him away to watering. Not, not this woman who's the daughter of Abraham. In other words, you care more about your animals than you care about people. And, if, and you care more about your rules than you care about people. See, what we got to do is stop caring about our rules, come on, more than we care about people. And when you start to care about people, you'll start to see people start to respond. Then Jesus comes to a man who's got a, a problem with his eye. He's blind. Hallelujah. He's blind Bartimaeus. Old Bart is showing up. And all of a sudden, Bart calls off. Hey, son of David. He recognizes this is the guy we've been waiting on. Yes, sir. He can't see with his natural eyes, but something of his spiritual eyes are up. He said, son of David, come on. I know under the old covenant there ain't no mercy, but in this one, come on. Have mercy on me. And Jesus turns around and heals the blind man. What he's doing, he's handpicking every one of these things here that disqualified you under an old covenant. Because in the old covenant, it was the ministry of condemnation. And in the new covenant, it's the ministry of affirmation. And 2 Corinthians 3 says this in the Message Bible. It says, for if the, uh, the, the glory of uh, if the glory of the, uh, I'm misquoting it here. 
if the government of affirmation or condemnation was glorious, that's how it says it in the message. Right? If the if the uh, 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 ministry of condemnation was glorious, how about this government of affirmation? So the old covenant condemns you; the new covenant affirms you. He accepts you in the blood and does the work in you. Man, I'm telling you, this is a win-win situation. I don't know if the, I'm about ready to do somersaults up here. I'm so happy about it. And so he starts opening the eyes of the blind. He's handpicking everything that was disqualified. He finds a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath. He finds eunuchs. He finds lepers. Running sores. He finds every one of these hunchback, scurvy, sores, all the, all, everything you can imagine that's disqualified under the Old Testament. And he handpicks them to show them, I've come. To bind up the brokenhearted and to set at liberty them that are bruised. And he's not talking to drug dealers on the streets, talking to people in religion their whole lives. And I said, God, what about a dwarf? He said, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. And that bad boy was a wee little man, was he? He climbed up in a sycamore tree yes, because he heard Jesus was going to come by that way and he wanted to see the Lord. The chapter prior to that, there's a Pharisee in the temple and he says, I thank God I'm not like that publican and that sinner. That same Pharisee asked Jesus in that chapter, what must I do to inherit the life of the coming age? Jesus said, you know the rules. And the guy starts saying, all of that I've done from my youth up. <laughs> Jesus said, well, one thing thou lackest, because under the law there's always something you're short of. He said, sell everything you got and give it to the poor. And the guy says, man, he went away sorrowful because he's, he, he's very rich. I think some of what he's wanting to give up is not his money. It's his confidence in that system. That's what he thought he was rich and increased in goods with. Now the message. So then all of a sudden, Jesus shows up in the next chapter and says, he went to the house, and the Pharisees say, this dude went to be guest of a man who's a publican and a sinner. I submit to you, it's the same guy they were pointing out to the temple, saying, I thank God I'm not like that sinner. That's the guy Jesus said, I think I'm going to go and hope about that dude. Yeah. These fellas over here ain't having no fun anyway, so we might as well go to their house. And he climbs up in a sycamore tree. Because this guy's really looking for Jesus. Anybody in the room really looking for Jesus? And you couldn't find him over there at the system? It left you bleeding and dying and it made you disqualified from the bread of God? Look, Zacchaeus was in a sycamore tree. The word sycamore here is a Greek word that says an inferior fig tree. That's significant. Why? Because the fig tree was the tree that Adam ate from to try to cover his nakedness. It was self-help religion to try to put a front up because all that a fig leaf can do is cover your front. If you ever turn around, people see how exposed you really are. And what, what Jesus says to Zacchaeus is what I believe he wants to say clear to every church around the world, and that is, come down out of that tree. You're in the wrong tree. There's a completely different tree. Come down out of that tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil because I must abide at your house. And then Jesus goes to his house, and when he goes to the house of Zacchaeus, he doesn't ask Zacchaeus to do anything. Don't ask him for an offering. Don't ask him to sell all he's got to give to the poor. He don't even ask him to pay back all the stuff he's folded. But when he gets finished with dinner with Jesus, Zach looks across the table at him. He says, hey, dude, I think I'm going, if, if I've done anybody wrong, I'm going to restore fourfold. And I think I'm going to give half my goods to the poor. See, under law, you couldn't give up a penny. Under grace, you really learn how to give. Hallelujah. Because you realize how much you've been forgiven of, it's easy to forgive. See, in the old covenant, if you don't forgive, you're not forgiven. In the new covenant, you forgive even as God, for Christ's sake, has already forgiven you. And you realize how much you've been forgiven of. Come on, you start to forgive other people. And you start, are you hearing where I'm coming from? And even these little actions bring God's new world into your environment. Hallelujah. So everything, and then Jesus finally, in the end of this story, he makes a great feast, and he bids many. Go ahead and stand on your feet all over this room. I need, I need to close here. And he, in, he, 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 he bids many. He invites them. And they begin to make an excuse. They can't come to the feast. 
And Jesus said, my feast is now ready. But those that were bidden didn't come. In other words, I gave Israel the first opportunity. In other words, I came to seek and save first to the house of Israel. They ain't coming to the feast. I love this. He said, go out into the highways and the byways and bring in the halt, the lame, the blind. Go get the dwarfs and the hunchbacks, the flat-nosed people, and people, everybody that was disqualified. And tell them, you're invited to a supper. Somebody said, I can't wait for the supper. The lamb, you know, the, the, the Mary Supper of the Lamb. I said, you know what's for supper? He said, no. I said, lamb. You don't have to wait to get there to eat it. You can eat some lamb today. You can come to the table today. The moment you find out the new covenant is your marriage certificate, you'll start acting like a wife instead of acting like you're going to get married. The new covenant is your marriage certificate. No covenant, no loving it. Hallelujah. No wed, no bed. That'll preach. That's a bumper sticker right there for you. Hallelujah. Good preaching. And the reality of it is, is that he invites him to supper. Come and die. Amazingly enough, even after Peter, who has just denied Jesus, he says, I'm going back to what I was doing before. This stuff, I had all my eggs in one basket. And this, is, this is the biggest failure I've been a part of. He's out on the boat fishing. When he comes to the bank, Jesus says, come and dine. You're not disqualified. Come to my table. Because if you eat lamb, what's going to happen is you get enough lamb in your belly, you're going to be like the children of Israel. You're going to say, I can't live in this bondage anymore. And I can't help but think of the story of a guy by the name of Mephibosheth. I didn't share this in the first service, but there's a little crippled boy in the, in, the, in, in the book of Samuel by the name of Mephibosheth who was the son of Jonathan, the great-grandson, or the grandson, I believe it was, of Saul. He's the only one left of the dynasty of Saul that's left of the house of Saul. King David has now ascended the throne and he's seated on the throne. How many of David speaks of the greater son of David, King Jesus? How many glad Jesus is on the throne today? And he looks around the room one day and King David says, is there anybody left of the house of Saul that I can do good unto him? That's a shocking man because every dynasty that would ever come to power would always kill the seed of the first dynasty so there's never any possibility of an insurrection or overthrowing the throne but here's king david saying i have a covenant that i made with jonathan between me and thee and between my seed and thy seed how many's glad we got a king that honors covenant man i feel the holy ghost in here this morning and somebody walked up to the king and said, there's a little cripple boy down in Lodibar, which means the place of scattering shame. He's ashamed of his family name. He's hiding out. He hopes you'll never know he's around. David said, go get him and bring him to the palace. I promise you when the thump of Horpus's hooves came down the road towards Mephibosheth's house, he, by the way, was dropped by a midwife at the age of five. Five is the number of grace. Anybody besides me ever been dropped? By a well-meaning religious system who gave you the right foot of fellowship. Hallelujah. Crippled you. You've been hiding out in Lodabar. Didn't think God even cared about you. I'm too bad for this. I can't go to church. Look at my life. I'm a wreck. I can't, I'm just qualified. I mean, I know the call of God was on my life, but look at me, you know. And you know, we, we stayed there in Lodabar. And the chariot of David pulls up, and, and this little cripple boy crawls up in the carriage, and he probably told the guy, listen, don't get in no hurry. I ain't no, don't bring no speed limits here, because this is probably my last day on the planet. I feel the Holy Ghost in here. He walks in. He no, didn't walk in the palace. He drags himself into the palace. If you could picture this. And King David is seated on the throne. And Mephibosheth looks at him, and he says, what am I? But a dead dog in the presence of the king. And David looks down at Mephibosheth and says to Mephibosheth, what I think he wants to say to us this morning, son, I didn't bring you here to kill you. I brought you here to give you back all your father's inheritance. Say what? I thought he was out to get me. But I found out it's inheritance. Somebody died and left me something. Hallelujah. 
I came to give you back all your father's inheritance. Furthermore, son, you don't even have to work in your fields. I'm inviting you to live in the palace and eat at my table. I'm inviting you to my table. Crippled footed, halt, lame, blind. Come on, somebody. I'm inviting you to sit at my table the rest of your days like one of my sons. And we're going to get Zeba to work your fields, and he's just going to bring the produce and all the good seeds. That's a picture of the Holy Ghost doing the work for you. He said, all I want you to do, sir, is come to the table. This, to me, is easy. I don't know how this would be. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, this is the simplest gospel I know how to tell you. It ain't about you or you fixing yourself or self-help or getting good enough or polishing yourself. It's about come and dine. You're invited to the table. Because if you eat what's on the table, what's on the table? Lamb. And you start eating the, and then it starts to change something because see, later on in the story, Mephibosheth has a son. Something must have started to work from the waist down. Y'all don't want to help me preach, but that's good news right there. Hallelujah. Maybe the crushed stones wasn't a problem. Now, I'm just being bold here this morning. It's in your Bible. Hallelujah. What I'm trying to get you to see is God begin to make him productive at a king's table. And I'm closing this morning, but I promise you that King David probably looked at his sons and he looked at his servants. How many leaders we got in the house? Let me, let me see your hand. Raise your hand. The leaders, pastors, whatever. See, these are the, 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 these are the leaders in the house. I, I think he probably said to the, to the servants and to the leaders, listen, guys, whatever you do, don't make fun of his crippled feet. When people come in, don't make fun of their crippledness. They're all, you hear where I come from? And I probably told his boys, his sons, listen, do not mock or make fun of Mephibosheth's crippled feet. And whatever you do when you come to the table, hear this, don't look under the table. Stop looking under the table. Because if you look under the table, what you're going to find is everybody at the table is crippled. Every last single one of us from this pulpit to the door are crippled in some area of our life. God loves broken people because broken people is all there is. But he doesn't leave us like we came. Regardless of popular opinion, grace is not the cause of sin, it's law. Grace is the antidote for it. For where sin abounds, grace will super. Hyper, hooper is the Greek word, abound. And if you've got hyper sin, you need hyper grace. That's why God's releasing the message of grace like crazy right now all over this planet is. God's new world is breaking into ours. And we're receiving the life of the coming age. Lift your hands all over this room this morning. If you don't know Jesus, and this is the first time you may have, you heard a lot of preaching, but you hadn't heard the gospel. Because you always left feeling like I'm not welcome, I'm not accepted, I don't fit. I want to say to you, welcome to the family. Because it's not about achieving, it's about receiving. If you don't know the Lord this morning, all you have to do is receive, receive the forgiveness of sin. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. Hallelujah. And then God starts to work in your world and starts to bring in a whole new kingdom colony in your life to bring about this new creation in you. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, for every person here this year, this morning, to don't know Jesus as their personal Savior, Lord, we just say with them, we receive you, Jesus. We need your help. I need a Savior. To all of us who came into this room this morning, even in the king's house, who've been crippled, broken, found bleeding and dying beside the Jericho Road, I want to pour in some oil and wine this morning. Just release the flow of the anointing oil to heal our wounds. Where when we're finished, we can leave the end knowing the bill has been fully paid and I've been made whole. Not just when I get to heaven, but right now, a little heaven to go to heaven with. 
And we thank you for that in the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. You've been gracious this morning. Let me say on the way out, we have a limited amount of books with us. Uh, the newest one I talked about back there, the great I am, is back there. From Law to Grace, A Kingdom Paradigm Shift is back there. There's one titled uh, Unforced Rhythms of Grace and one called The Revelation of Jesus Christ. That's actually a second edition we just released not too long ago with some upgrades in it. So you can go back by there. There's a whole bunch of jump drives with audio stuff on there. Somebody be back there to help you with it. I think we do a deal when we're on the road, all four books for 50 bucks. And then there's some uh, audio stuff back there. Uh, there's also a card back there, I think, on the table or in some of those books that has a QR code. If you want to scan it and you want to become part of our Message of the Month Club, we do a streaming service on the Message of the Month. You can, if you, you put your phone on it, it'll take you right there and you can sign up for it immediately. And there's a whole host of stuff there. That's all I'm going to say about that. It's back there and available to you. I don't like to talk about material, but it's back there, so you can drop by on the way out. Somebody there to help you. We do take credit cards as well and checks and cash and all that kind of stuff. Thank you. Come on, Pastor, and just uh, uh, for the final remarks. Hallelujah. Thank you. I won't stand up here and try to rehash any of that, so may the good Lord keep you and bless you, and may his face shine upon you as you travel throughout your week, and just remember that I love you and God loves you. You guys have a great day. Oh, yeah, and make sure you guys get here for Gospel Circle tonight. I'll see you at 7.